if you remember uh, very quickly, we got to the point where I was arguing for a different kind of uh, epistemological ontology. I compared a mechanistic, atomistic view, bottom up, to a more holistic, top down, network oriented, relations first, nodes after kind of perspective. That was the things and relations uh, topic uh, just above construction and conception. We can now move to construction and conception. And to do so, um, let me go back to a point that we uh, covered in the previous lectures. I hope you remember uh, this particular way of presenting the digital uh, or digital technologies, including uh, artificial intelligence, of course, these days. <coughs> I'd like to exp um, explain a little bit better why this uh, is important as a perspective. As you read there, uh, the digital does not uh, give us a description of the world as a cultural revolution, and it doesn't tell us how the world should be. It generates new forms of reality, so it inscribes uh, the world. This inscription, or this adding new pages to the book of nature, more on this in a moment, because it's actually a uh, quotation from uh, uh, a quote from uh, Galileo, means that it is also, as he adds new pages to the world, it also changes our way of understanding the world. So mind the two sort of steps. One, there's something that we uh, metaphorically describe as the book of nature. The world out there is like a book, and we read it. More on this in a moment. That's what science does. That's what uh, scholarship uh, or any form of understanding um, is normally involved in reading the book of nature. The digital is adding new pages to that book of nature. So it's not just about reading it, but it's also or above all expanding it. By doing so, second sort of impact, uh, the other side of the uh, inscription of the world, it changes our way of conceptualizing the world. So this may sound a little bit too compressed, but it comes from, as I said, from uh, <coughs> uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, from Galileo. We are in 1623, and Galileo publishes uh, a very famous, uh, very important book. Um, called Il Saggiatore, um, and it's not just because I'm Italian that I know about this. Uh, this is like talking about uh, one of the three uh, great guys in physics, uh, Galileo, Newton, Einstein. Um, so I leave the uh, uh, long quotation there for you to read, um, because I want to highlight a couple of points uh, once you have had time to read it that are fundamental to understand what the digital is doing to our own understanding of the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, first of all, uh, the metaphor of the universe as a, as a book. Uh, you can see how Gutenberg has made a big difference uh, to uh, our culture. Uh, the book has become an analogy for reality. Then uh, the second line, uh, sorry, the second point there, uh, science reads that book. The book is written in a particular language. <clears throat> I beg your pardon. Um, this is still uh, recovering from a post-COVID, uh, very friendly COVID that doesn't want to uh, entirely leave me. Um, the language, as you can see halfway through the uh, quote, is the language of mathematics. So point number one, nature is like a book. It's written in a specific language that science needs and has to be able to read. What language? The language of mathematics. Well, that's, that's, that's a huge step. You will not find this in uh, any uh, other uh, previous philosophy, uh, generally speaking. You have to go back all, all the way to the Pythagoreans um, in Greek philosophy to have something vaguely similar. But look at what kind of mathematics Galileo has in mind. Triangles, circles, geometrical figures, this is important, and I want to spend a few minutes with a, a tiny, tiny, tiny uh, sort of um, incursion into uh, the history of the philosophy of mathematics. 
Remember 1623, uh, this is uh, just around uh, the time of the scientific revolution. The other great figure in this uh, sort of turning point, modernity, etc., is Descartes. You know about Descartes, even if you have no philosophy, because of the Cartesian axis. The Cartesian axis are the X and Y, uh, which yeah. dominate any statistical analysis, uh, any uh, calculus and so on. Uh, you go variables on the X and, and the Y, and you can calculate this and that. The fundamental uh, change that Descartes onwards uh, makes to the history of mathematics, a change that Galileo has not yet absorbed, um, but will come much later, is that until this time, Descartes, Galileo, uh, roughly speaking, uh, the uh, 1600 or something, the queen of mathematics is still geometry, is still essentially Euclid. And so when you think in terms of mathematics, for those people and before them, you don't think one, two, three. You think triangles, circles, geometrical figures. The mathematics that uh, Galileo is using is not the mathematical of equations, uh, as we're going to see, but it's a, a, above all a mathematics of comparative analysis, much more algebra, uh, which is the way in which you prove, for example, um, Pythagoras' theorem, A to B, A C to D, etc. But it doesn't have those kind of intrinsic quantities. Now, Galileo is the guy who's actually introducing experiments, he start quantifying, but the quantification of nature, which comes with a mathematical, arithmetical, number-based approach, is still in the making, so much so that when Galileo has to tell us that the language of mathematics in which the Book of Nature is written is such and such, it goes back to a geometrical perspective. Almost, as I said, Pythagorean, uh, kind of Greek uh, in its essence, is not sufficiently modern. Today, if you were to tell people, oh look, no, the, the world is written in the mathematical, uh, in the language of mathematics, and ask anyone, uh, uh, what kind of language is that? People will immediately think in terms of numbers, uh, whatever numbers they have in mind, and it could be strange numbers, um, but it will be quantities. Um, it will be uh, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, etc. cetera, uh, statistical probabilities, um, but it will not be you know, a geometrical world. Why that? Well, there's one passage, uh, if you like, if you want to remember anything, uh, which is the following. Descartes, with the uh, Cartesian axis, solves that very, very, very peculiar problem, which we have found here. And let me show you. In this slide. Remember when we covered what is a point? Well, a point can be a third thing. It can be the limit of a line. It can be a cut of a 1D line, or it can be a couple of numbers. A point on the Cartesian axis is a value of the X and a value of the Y. I hope this is clear. I don't have a slide to show you because it's elementary school, not even uh, middle school. So if you have the Cartesian axis, remember that kind of L uh, with the X at the bottom and the Y on the side, and you have a value for the X, say 2, and a value on the y, say three. You draw a line and another line, and where they meet there, it's a point. So a point becomes a couple of numbers, written normally, you know, with uh, some uh, simple arithmetic um, notation, and it could be, in this case, say uh, x equal two. So you put two comma y equal three. So two comma three. And 2,3 identifies a point in a single point on the plane. So what you have just done is to transform geometry into arithmetics. This translation of geometry into a, a arithmetic is crucial because it's the beginning of the long, long journey that will lead us all the way to computer science. Back to us, this sentence here, therefore, is really highlighting a turning point in the history of mathematics. Geometry is still <clears throat> the queen of all uh, mathematical disciplines. It will not be the queen for long. 
arithmetic will replace it. Arithmetic will replace it in terms of the foundation for all mathematics. Now that we can reduce, say, or simplifying the Cartesian axis, any uh, geometrical figure to um, spe a specific you know, set of numbers, <clears throat> at that point you can uh, uh, describe curves, you can um, waves, um, circles, triangles, just as a bunch of numbers arithmetically you know, structured. Geometry becomes arith arithmetics. Arithmetics will keep going for a long time. It will uh, become uh, calculus uh, with uh, Newton and Leibniz. At that point, not only you can describe geometrical figures with numbers, but you can describe movement, change with numbers. The reason why both Leibniz and Newton came up with uh, the calculus is because they needed to understand how, for example, planets would go around in that particular sort of pattern. And you cannot simply describe that in terms of a fixed circle or a fixed curve. You need to have something dynamic, something that keeps moving, changes through time. So calculus is developed. Calculus becomes the uh, uh, power horse of any any sort of discipline that needs to calculate how something moves from A to B. So in economics, for example, uh, how you want to calculate anything uh, as a uh, sort of uh, historical uh, transformation of, say, inflation, um, the crisis of mathematics, and we're almost uh, at the end of this little mini lecture on the history of mathematics and the philosophy of mathematics, happens once people start wondering about what lies below arithmetics. What is the ultimate ground? How can I justify my mathematical understanding, which is no longer geometrical, because geometry is grounded on uh, arithmetics, and arithmetics is grounded on what? Well, it's grounded on depending on uh, which tradition you belong to, mathematical logic plus set theory. The crisis of the foundations in mathematics happens when uh, people start wondering what is the grounding for set theory and uh, mathematical logic. We're now uh, around the time with, uh, when uh, Frege is doing his work. Um, a work very similar will be done by uh, Peirce in the United States, but Frege is much more uh, visible, much more known. Uh, also thanks to Whiten and Russell, Principia Mathematica, we make the third step. Geometry is grounded on uh, arithmetics. Arithmetics is grounded on uh, um, the foundation of arithmetics is mathematical logic. At that point, mathematical logic needs only one more step to be reduced to a uh, sort of logic of uh, zeros and ones. Once you have that, uh, the computational sort of uh, transformation of our mathematical sense of the world is conclude. Oh, by the way, the uh, crisis of foundations uh, ends up by the assumption of some um, axioms that need to be uh, assumed. Um, and there will be more uh, coming in the following years, Gödel, uh, incompleteness theorem, etc. Uh, but that is for another day, for another story. What we have completed here at this point is that today, when you read, uh, uh, people quote this sentence only up to it is written in language, language mathematics. And if you read that, no, uh, the universe is a grand book written in the language of mathematics. You are completely no, misled in terms of what Galileo had in mind. He was thinking geometry, we're thinking computers. The movement from geometry through arithmetics, through calculus, through foundations of mathematics, to mathematical logic, to uh, Boolean logic, etc., etc., all the way to computers is very interesting and you will deserve a much <laughs> better presentation that I'm giving you uh, here at the moment. But it is fundamental. Final point on this amazingly rich uh, sort of uh, text in front of us. Uh, I want to stress this. This without which it is humanly impossible to comprehend a single word of it. Without this, one is wandering in a dark labyrinth. This was already in Plato. No one should enter here, remember, who doesn't know about geometry. That was uh, not the Platonist, not old Pythagorean view about the world uh, made of uh, uh, five or four or X number of solids, etc. Um, this is about education. We still think that uh, we can uh, not educate people uh, in purely um, uh, linguistic, non-mathematical, non-geometrical, um, non-computational way. I think uh, Galileo was right. Uh, and uh, if we keep uh, educating our philosophers, for example, 
in a way that they do not understand at all uh, what it means to have uh, even the basic uh, uh, sort of, uh, acquaintance with propositional calculus uh, or some probability theory, etc. Well, that's what you find here, wandering in a dark labyrinth, and you notice you can see the darkness. And the wandering might be successful. I mean, it doesn't mean that one doesn't find the exit uh, of a dark labyrinth, but it takes much, much uh, longer. And the number of times you bump into the wrong wall are staggering. Uh, a reminder to uh, for people who uh, might uh, have uh, sort of, uh, forgotten, um, Husserl, uh, uh, just to mention someone who uh, did know about mathematics, um, uh, started as a mathematician. He, uh, he had a PhD in mathematics. Uh, Heidegger did not, uh, and you can see the difference. Moving forward, this is what therefore has happened in uh, our big metaphor about the book of nature. In the past, as you can tell uh, from the sort of uh, geometrical picture that I put there, uh, by the way, uh, this is meant to be uh, a non-religious reference to that. Um, religious people, I hope, will not be offended. Non-religious people, I hope, will not be offended. Uh, it's just a matter of a cultural reference to something that in Western philosophy is very common. Uh, the idea that uh, the book of nature has been written by God. It's written in mathematical symbols. Uh, the writer is not us, the writer is God. So in first line, God's writing, what you have is a twofold sort of writing. God in the you know, Christian, Western, uh, kind of parochial uh, philosophy that we inhabit here, uh, in this corner of the, of the world, writes in mathematic symbol, or writes you know, the, uh, what we are going to read twice. He writes it ontologically by creating the world in that particular sort of fundamentally mathematical way. And then he writes it again through a special text, uh, for example, the Bible or the uh, Quran. So if God's writing is both ontological, the universe, and semantic, the Bible, for example. Now this uh, God as an architect, you find it in Platonus, you find it in Thomas Aquinas, no, it's all over the place. Um, the novelty from Galileo onwards is that uh, is the reading which happens to be the human side of God's writing. Uh, the God's writing was there and it kept uh, sort of uh, being the um, sort of, uh, constant in, uh, in their philosophical culture. Um, Galileo is stressing that the counterpart is the ability of humanity to read God's writing. The point that I've been stressing is that there is a third step here after Galileo. We are doing the writing. Now that is what I meant by saying that the digital inscribes the world. By, and I'm emphasizing the digital, but actually, it, as you may imagine, is a long technological uh, transformation. Um, as we move forward, God's writing is quickly replaced by our own writing. And our own writing is both ontological, we create new forms of reality, uh, new ways of inhabiting the world, and semantic, modeling that world in a way that makes sense. Remember what I told you before, uh, the, the, the two steps, we are adding new pages to the book of nature. And by doing so, we are transforming how we understand that book on nature from a digital perspective. So the digital not only is the writing of pieces of the world, anytime you put forward somewhere a piece of code, that is a new piece of maths that is inhabiting the world, a new sort of a little line in the huge book of nature. But by doing that, we are also acquiring a perspective, uh, a level of abstraction, uh, which is very digital. And from that perspective, we remake sense something to be said much more clearly and more carefully in a few, uh, no, in the next, basically in the next lecture, but we are reinterpreting and therefore re-ontologizing the whole world as we have seen it. Let me pause for a moment here. Think about what I just said. The point that I made would not be meaningful and it 
if you went for all the reconstruction that I provided. So what, I, what you see in front of you, you know, God's writing, the ontology, the semantics, God, the arc, the pattern, et cetera, human reading, and so on. We now reinterpret all this in light of the fact that we are writing, digitally speaking, both the ontology and the semantics of the world we inhabit. Well, that sort of final point casts a completely new light on what we have seen before. It's a bit like a, a, sort of a, a narrative in which you discover halfway through that actually that character X, Y, and Z has changed and what seemed to be so and so is really such and such. The facts remain the same, but the interpretation changes. These facts, the same interpretation, different, is what I'm talking about here when I say you know, we are re-ontologizing also our perception of the world. So when uh, referring to uh, written in uh, a mathematical uh, language, um, that's the actual Italian uh, in a uh, lingua, in a language that is mathematical, we move from geometry to logic, from logic to programming, and from programming onwards, we think of the world as uh, more the matrix, um, just to be uh, totally uh, pop culture. Uh, if you remember some classic moments in uh, in that uh, series, um, uh, especially the first movie, um, amazingly good, so if, w worth uh, watching again. It's all about numbers. Uh, of course, they have the numbers need to at some point uh, get a shape. That's why I uh, picked up this particular uh, picture as a background. But it is the numbers that make the difference, uh, not the shapes, not the geometry. The reading at some point becomes a matter of equations. This is uh, the last sort of uh, nasty uh, bit of, of maths that I want to show you. Um, uh, I want to show you this for very simple reasons, uh, and I, I focus only on those uh, two equations. Oh, by the way, the, the book is worth reading. Uh, Ian Stewart is a great uh, mathematician now. I think he's retired from Warwick. Uh, has written some amazing, uh, very uh, uh, enlightening uh, introductory books to um, uh, mathematics. Um, this one, 17 Equations That Change the World, if you have time during the summer, hugely recommended, uh, very readable. Uh, it explains why those 17 which are there um, are so crucial in everyday life. Now, I pick up only two which are absolutely so, uh, uh, high school, uh, one and four, uh, say Pythagoras theorem, everybody knows about it, or the law of gravity, uh, Newton, etc. Any other would do, but uh, it would probably test my ability to explain them uh, quite significantly. Uh, of course, I'm very attached to number 15, uh, Shannon uh, equation for information theory. But let's uh, uh, just look at the um, the two in the red squares. Uh, in fact, you, we can actually concentrate on only one, the top one. The fundamental thing to understand about equations is that they all share one symbol, and that's the equal to. Let me repeat this because I know it's very simple and it sounds very stupid, but that's all there is here. Look through the whole series of equations and you will find that uh, they're equal to, sometimes uh, uh, written as equal or uh, larger than, bigger than, uh, C equation number 12. Uh, sometimes I think there is one equation which, um, uh, uh, no, that symbol doesn't appear. Uh, I'll tell you more in a, in a moment about the, uh, the three lines, uh, which I put in yellow on the right hand side. Um, but equal to is exactly how we, how we do what Galileo uh, meant us to do. You translate something into something else. What is uh, true on the left is equal to what is true on the right and vice versa. When people tell you that time doesn't exist, for example, is because uh, physics equations can be read from left to right and from right to left. Well, that's what the equal says. You could uh, say in the uh, uh, Pythagoras theorem, you could actually invert c square equal to a square plus b square. You could write in that way. It wouldn't be very informative, um, not as much as the way we write it there, but it is exactly what we're saying. If you uh, find this um, confusing, is perhaps because they also look like definitions. Water equal to H2O or 
bachelor equal to and married man, they all share the same equal to. But in one case, we're talking about um, uh, something that equates something else as we have discovered it mathematically or empirically. We couldn't just sit down and decide that that was Pythagoras theorem. The other equal to is just a stipulation and should not be confused with the, the equation. You stipulate that from now on, the name of this boy is Luciano. So Luciano equal to this boy and this boy equal to Luciano. Well, we just agreed on that. From now on, we decide that the value of this banknote is no, 10 euros. You name it. Back to the uh, bachelor. Um, in English, the definition of bachelor is male, human, and married. If you have one on the right, you have the other one on the left, and vice versa. It's just a matter of agreement. If we don't like it, we could change tomorrow. We say, well, you know what? I don't like this male, for example, uh, idea. You could have a bachelor who is male or female uh, and married individual, and it could be fine. In fact, it could be you know, uh, the way we're going to speak tomorrow. Um, so let's not confuse things that we um, can model in the world by working with the world. Remember, we're still modeling the world. We're modeling the world in a way that the law of gravity makes sense, but we're not stipulating that that is the law of gravity. And from now on, uh, I decide that uh, the world will go in that particular way. When people get confused, um, and there's plenty of them, um, especially you know, uh, in the pop culture, but also among philosophers, or oh, science is just a matter of stipulations. They confuse equations with definitions. Definitions are a matter of agreement. You can change them and nothing you know, happens. Equations are a matter of successful interaction with the data, remember, the signal sent by the source. The source is nature, in this case, law of gravity. Send us some signals. We can make sense of those signals through the law of gravity. You cannot simply stipulate what those signals mean because it's not up to us to decide. We are reading message sent by nature. Now, notice the slight difference uh, sort of, uh, analogy compared to um, Galileo. Galileo said that we were reading nature. We're not. We're reading what nature sent us as a signal, uh, which means that whatever nature is in itself, well, we leave it to any metaphysical speculation, uh, or indeed, as Kant would say, to God's perspective. Another story for another day. So um, I just want to make sure that uh, here uh, you uh, also have this other uh, bit of information. Uh, the symbol equal to was introduced in 1557. It's not that old. Um, how mathematicians uh, used to do maths without that little symbol, which seems to be so fundamental. Well, you can tell that before uh, inventing uh, literally the graphics of equal to, uh, thanks to Robert uh, Record, um, they had to write, it is equal to. So if you read mathematical text before 1557, you actually write the bit of English or German or whatever, or Latin, meaning such and such and such is equal to such and such and such. Robert decided that he needed something shorter. So he put those two symbols and he put those because um, uh, he had in mind two parallel line being equal, equally uh, distance from each other. That's why we have that symbol. Much later, uh, an Italian uh, logician will introduce uh, the three lines to distinguish between um, uh, a equation, which is the uh, two lines, and a definition, the three lines, so that you don't get confused uh, instead of uh, uh, thinking that um, the bachelor is an unmarried man and the law of gravity are just the same thing. Uh, no, an agreement among humans to treat the world in such and such way. Now, once we have this, um, Back to the original point. Remember when I told you, now it seemed to be like a, a bit of an abstract concept uh, many, many hours ago. Our culture is moving, it's not stable, it's constantly changing, uh, and it's now moving in terms of scientific interaction with the world from mimesis to poiesis, from a representation to a interaction construction of the world. It has nothing to do with anti realism. I'm not saying that therefore the world is built by us, social construction. There is no such thing as external reality. It's all about what we decide, culturally speaking, values, biology, chemistry, physics. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that 
we are moving from the Galilean, Galilean view that we are simply reading the book of nature to a view that is increasingly um, a matter of intervention as well. We're also building and creating and writing bits of that book. And the more we write that, bit, that book, the more we understand the book differently. We are no longer just readers. We are authors of both how the world is and is developing and how society uh, or personal identity, etc., are becoming. So once you get a more poetic perspective, there's another piece of um, bit of uh, history of philosophy that uh, I can share with you and then back to the main track. It's called uh, the uh, maker's knowledge tradition. I uh, highlighted a few bits of this in the past. Um, uh, there's a whole paper written on this, if you like. Um, but if we go back to Plato, the makers of something, according to Plato, doesn't know the artifact as well as the user of the artifact. So the artisan who has built, uh, or, uh, has uh, created, design, uh, constructed, uh, produced, uh, say, a vase, um, literally a vase, doesn't know uh, that vase uh, in the same way, but above all, as well as actually the user of that vase knows it. It's very counterintuitive. And in fact, I think that Plato got it completely wrong. Um, in other passages, in other contexts, Plato has a much more nuanced perspective. But what we have inherited from Plato is that the maker of something doesn't know that something really very well. The people who actually know very well uh, that art, uh, artifact are the user of the artifact, which today would be a little bit like saying that um, the engineers and the producers of the smartphone in front of you um, know less well their artifact than you do being the user of the artifact is very peculiar. And yet, it was so well entrenched with the culture of the time and the rest of the history of the time uh, of, of our philosophy that has stayed with us throughout, even these days. So if you pick up an introduction to epistemology, it will be all about looking at the world, observing the world, perceiving the world. What's the world is like as a viewer uh, as someone who has to reproduce mimesis the world from take a picture of the world have an idea inside your mind etc cetera, etc cetera, all the way to uh, trying to uh, figure out what the world is by having a galilean reading of the world meanwhile now what we have really been doing uh, in our, our everyday culture has been to emphasize more and more the fact that those who make something they really know how their something works now, of course, Plato, etc., uh, had plenty of reasons to uh, undermine an artisan uh, sort of knowledge of the base and the aristocrat sort of knowledge of how to use that base. Uh, if you read Plato, the, num the number of, sort of maneuvers that he has to make in order to convince you that that is the right way of looking at it are quite uh, sort of interesting. It remains unconvincing. Um, but don't get me wrong, from Plato onwards, epistemology uh, or science Epistemology as the theory of science and science as the theory of reality is mimetic, is a representation, is watching. And as you watch, you understand better. Plato has in the background, and that sort of will echo again back in Kant, the suspicion that um, actually, if you are God and you build the world, well, you know that world much, much better intrinsically for what it is then if you are just not one, a user, a, a, a viewer, um, uh, someone who is an outsider and uh, has a sense of how to use the remote control for that particular sort of world and change channels. Um, but it never develops that. And uh, that point becomes uh, very complicated in Kant because Kant at some point needs to balance the importance of the maker's knowledge, if only you could know the world from God's eyes perspective, you will know the world intrinsically for what it is at the source, not the signal, but you will know the nature as the book of nature that uh, sort of, uh, Galileo was presenting. And yet at the same time, tell us, telling us, look, uh, human knowledge is about representation, it's about the phenomena, it's not about the noumena, it's not about the thing in themselves, and therefore you have to make the most of your models, but you have no access 
divine or direct or maker's uh, knowledge access to the system. As you can tell, as we move forward and we get more and more poetic, so to, think, so to speak, we have more and more responsibility for what we are building. From biotechnology to materials to pharmaceutical products to uh, climate change, there's virtually nothing around us that hasn't been transformed, modified, um, uh, shaped by our own intervention. And the more we intervene, the more we shape our lives and the world around us, the more we get both the view and the responsibility of minor gods, so to speak. So when it comes to technology, there is a debate which work in progress. I haven't explored, but if anyone on this call wants to go ahead, let me know. I'm definitely very interested. But it's a, a late uh, 19th century debate in Germany, which hasn't been studied uh, much. It's a matter of history or philosophy where some German philosophers tried to apply Kantian philosophy to the philosophy of technology. And they hit a wall because Kant's position is you cannot know the system because you're not God. You didn't build the system, but you know what you are responsible for epistemologically. Now, if you are in charge, well, you are in charge of the model, never of the system. And that's where your knowledge is. Apply this to philosophy of technology and it's a mess because, of course, technology is what we build intrinsically. We know inside out what it's in it and what it isn't. Imagine a clock, no? a classic example. Remember the mechanism, etc. that we showed before. And so how come that we have this no knowledge of the intrinsic nature of the artifact when we are the artisan who made the, the uh, artifact? And it's no longer just a matter of you know, partial problem with the artisan and the base when no, the rest of the universe is actually nature and therefore is given to us. But it's a problem of, well, pretty much everything that is surrounding us. So the shift from mimesis to poiesis is also what you find. And this is a very, very big picture from what, uh, from where to approach explainability in AI. And I find it a little bit strange, well, no, that's philosophical view, that when people discuss the explainability in AI, there is no reference to all this because this is the actual context where that problem is landing. It's an artifact. We are the builders, make us knowledge. We should know exactly what's happening, what's not happening in it. And yet we have built a system that is so complex in a way to be described later in terms of complexity that we cannot predict what the system does. So here is another chapter in this uh, sort of dialectic. We're back to the view that actually as users, Uh, uh, solutions, uh, the delusions or hallucinations, to use a bad technical term, much more popular these days uh, in machine learning, uh, than the original uh, makers. So in this sort of dialectic between user, maker, artifact, built by whom, known by whom, we're now back to the you know, other pole of the swinging kind of uh, dialectic and ask again, almost as if we were Plato, do we really know this artifact or are the users better placed to know how it works because they can test it all the time? Here, um, final point, we need to shift from a different perspective in terms of what it means to have an explanation. Indeed, um, when it comes to uh, machine learning, we have built systems that are as complex as nature. And therefore, uh, uh, as impenetrable sometimes as nature is. There's nothing magic, uh, there's nothing sort of uh, extraterrestrial or existentially risky or anything that uh, smells of superstition here. It's just that if you put enough nodes, enough links and enough thresholds, uh, you build enough complexity, explainability is no longer the kind that you find in the mimetic uh, sort of uh, sciences. You need a poetic kind of explanation, which is just another way of saying you need to shift from explanation as is understood in the mathematical sciences to explanation as is understood in the social sciences. Final point, I think is uh, enough on your uh, plate for today. In the social sciences, explanation is 
teleological in view of an end. Let me give you a, a super simple example and then we finish this lecture. Imagine you need to explain to someone why there's so much traffic, say in New York, this morning, Monday morning, 8.30 in the morning, it's raining, schools are open. What is exactly the explanation? You have gazillions of cars everywhere, no one is moving, do we have an explanation of that? Yes, it's Monday morning, everybody's trying to go to the office, uh, everybody's trying to uh, get the kids to school, it's raining and I don't know, uh, there's a tunnel uh, block or that road is not working or uh, there's been an accident. I find that perfectly fine and it's a perfectly fine explanation. It doesn't tell me why every single driver is at their place at their time. That mimetic uh, explanation is what physics would require. Switch to physics why the ball hits the ball and why the other ball moves, etc. cetera, Newtonian physics. Well, we can actually calculate all the balls and all the uh, sort of triangulation, etc. And we have a sense that we understand the causal, you know, all this happens, therefore all that happens, uh, uh, link here, is what we would expect in a normal physical, biological, chemical uh, world, where we try to capture, remember, the signals coming from nature, uh, through equations, see above. That explanation works perfectly fine. And if, indeed, as the world we are interacting with becomes more and more complex, say in quantum physics, more and more we rely on probabilities. Necessity in even the mimetic sciences goes out of the window pretty quickly. You have enough bodies interacting with each other. Look at uh, Wikipedia, the three body problem, which has got nothing to do with academic positioning uh, of uh, uh, people in search of a job. Um, uh, but it's actually the interactions in the sort of uh, in terms of uh, uh, Newtonian physics of three bodies. And you already know that that becomes uh, not predictable in a sort of uh, deterministic way. So determinism and the simple causal, uh, the stone thrown against the glass, breaks the glass sort of uh, model, even in mimetic, mimetic uh, simple uh, approach, sciences goes uh, out of the window pretty quickly. We move quickly towards statistical analysis, uh, margin of errors, no, that little tab that you find on top of the, any statistical decent analysis, um, footnote or footnote. Every time you read about how many jobs are going to be destroyed by um, AI, look for that little tab, error margin. If it's not there, that's rubbish. End of note. Uh, back to us. Mimetic analysis, therefore, uh, is already probabilistic. When it comes to uh, social um, or other complex uh, um, uh, systems, we know that we have given up the possibility of having a deterministic step-by-step -step explanation a long time ago. You must have read at least you know, something about, say, the uh, causes of the Second World War. There's nothing magic about the Second World War. In fact, it's everything tragic. It's a human, dis no, horrible, disastrous uh, episode in, in our history. Do we have that sense of, if this, then that, the Newtonian billiard balls not causing each other sort of explanation? Of course not. And we could pile up a huge number of explanations to make sense of that uh, episode. We could go way back to, say, the First World War. We could even go back to um, colonialism and the British Empire and the emergence of America as a superpower, Japan history, etc. Um, God knows where we can go back to and how many causes we can accumulate. And as in yesterday, uh, at some point, that network of nodes and relations gets cut off and says, you know, some are too distant. If we keep getting all the way there, we will never get the real causes. And so we might say something about you know, the end of the First World War, uh, Germany emerging as a new superpower, the British uh, Empire, uh, the crisis uh, of France that uh, has not, not sort of, uh, emerged uh, as a stable country after the, uh, the, uh, the new sort of imperial uh, moment. You can pile up a number of economic, political causes, etc. The emergence of uh, the uh, Nazism and fascism or throughout Europe. But you circumscribe all that to a few nodes and a few links. And that's what we call an explanation. Well, that's exactly what we do uh, in uh, 
explaining complex systems like neural networks uh, or the machine learning in general. It doesn't mean that there's something unexpected, something that all of a sudden will become intelligent uh, and so on. That is magic thinking. The move from mimesis to poiesis is not a move from no, science to magic. It's just doing science more seriously, assuming therefore and realizing that a lot of the explanations we have are statistical, probabilistically based, and in terms of what is more relevant at the right level of abstraction. Back to New York, the right level of abstraction is not why every car is there for what reason, because that will be asking why every node in my neural network is, done, is doing what it's doing according to that threshold, so that no, it does what it does. Impossible, but it's okay to just have the level of abstraction at which what matters is the weather, schools open yes or no, offices open yes or no, any traffic, uh, so, so any in, uh, accident happening in downtown. These are the types. Those are the variables that I matter, and I can have an explanation of this and that, to the extent that I can actually change things. And for example, I can change the time when the schools open so that I don't have the same problem. Now, back to us, as you can tell, there is a lot in all this uh, movement. The digital revolutions, now we come to an end of this lecture, as you may have uh, sort of realized, it's opening entirely new uh, open uh, questions, questions we haven't had before. I just gave you the, a couple of examples in terms of what do we mean by the language of mathematics when it comes to reading the book of nature. Are we reading the book of nature or are we reading the signals sent by nature, which is a completely different story. If you read the book of nature, you're reading the noumenon, the reality in itself. If you're reading the signals sent by, the, by nature, well, you, have, you are in a modeling system kind of uh, uh, relation. Are we, and that was just one example, the second example uh, just uh, covered uh, now, um, when it comes to not just the mathematical book of nature, but when it comes to explanation, what do we mean by an explanation today? Uh, it cannot be the same that we meant uh, when Newton was around. Uh, there's much more uh, probabilistic thinking, uh, margins of errors, level of abstraction at which a, uh, uh, an explanation is always not satisfactory. We have, as a matter of consequence, a concept deficit and a project deficit, which is good news for people in this room, <laughs> uh, virtually. It means that there's a huge amount of super interesting work to do. Um, the joke is that when there are problems, uh, uh, philosophers and lawyers are very happy. Uh, we have a career as philosophers and lawyers make a lot of money. Um, having a concept deficit, meaning having a chance of getting out of that low stage in the history of philosophy, uh, we're getting out of the Heideggerians and the Wittgensteinians, we can be uh, philosophers ourselves, we can tackle philosophical problems, we don't have time for philosophers problems anymore, not at this stage, the uh, problems that are surrounding us are too pressing, too important, they're going to make too much of a difference to waste time interpreting someone else's thought and did he say or did he not say what he actually said or not. Project deficit. Well, uh, if anything, uh, I hope something has uh, come out quite clearly that modernity doesn't work anymore. And it doesn't work not even in a postmodern reactionary sense of, well, we're no longer them, but we don't know who we are in ourselves. I wish I had a, a brilliant label to uh, name our century or non-modern uh, uh, time. I don't. And hopefully someone in this room, uh, virtually uh, speaking, uh, will come up with one. At some point we will have one and one will stick. I hope it will be the good one, but certainly what we are missing is a non-modern project. Remember the age of the eye? We need a much more uh, uh, timely um, a, a project now. It will be the end of this uh, set of lectures uh, when I will talk about the green and the blue and the human project but certainly it's worth all our efforts to understand who we want to be when we grow up as a new sort of culture, as a new uh, epoch. We're not modern, uh, we have been modern, we don't have to be modern anymore. Modernity doesn't fit uh, the um, uh, needs that we have today. It's not a criticism of modernity, it's just a matter of using the same metaphor, moving to the next chapter, which we have to write. At this point, uh, the sort of uh, philosophy, and we're coming to the end of uh, uh, quite simple slides here, something that I will not pursue in this uh, course, because it, as you may imagine, it's also a way of rethinking philosophy as the place where the human project is elaborated 
and the uh, concept deficit and the project deficit are addressed, well, one way of understanding uh, all this is a, a need for rebooting philosophy. And I think you know, rebooting is a good metaphor, not given also our digital vocabulary. But remember, the ups and downs, the, and the ups and downs. When you're down, you need to reboot the system and start, not from scratch, but learning from the previous lectures, uh, sorry, uh, lessons, and addressing the new uh, pressing needs. This rebooting means probably developing, um, but of course, this is me telling you what I've been doing. So uh, uh, it's entirely biased and entirely self-serving. But if anything, we need a new philosophy uh, of information as understood partly, at least, in terms of what I've been sharing with you last year and this year. And we need to understand philosophy as conceptual design uh, for our time uh, and of our time. Now, that, those sentences are a bit bombastic, uh, and I'm sorry for that. It's just a synthesis of what I think uh, young generations and uh, thinkers should be doing. Um, now, uh, with uh, a uh, apology for uh, the uh, postman, which makes all this very analog and not very digital, uh, no, resolved by my wife, uh, luckily, uh, we're back to, uh, to the lecture. Um, conceptual design, what we've been doing in this lecture, um, understanding how to shape problems, how to shape answers, and how to fit the right answer to the right uh, problems. Nothing new. I think philosophy has always been conceptual design. Good philosophy should be conceptual design, has been like that since Socrates onwards. In conceptual design, uh, understood as philosophy, you should be able to criticize. It's a must and it's a precondition, uh, and it does mean a certain kind of philosophy. The philosophy that is not uh, developed as a um, oracle that speaks and people just have to listen and interpret. We just we want to be participants in the dialogue in terms of understanding rationally and informatively what's going on. And the last line there means that the kind of philosophy that we need to develop is not a timeless one. The one that is good for any season at any time, for any uh, human being, for any culture, for any history. Well, that is wonderful. But what we need today is a philosophy for our time uh, that enables us to understand the open problems that we have and develop the right, as in fit for uh, solutions for those problems. That's why it needs to know uh, of our time, for our time. Now, this is a bit more sort of Hegelian Marxist that you would expect from someone from me, like me, but then no, you learn from the best. Philosophy as conceptual designs, uh, as I told you a moment ago, formulates the right open questions and offers the right open answers. I stress the second line, answers. Philosophy is not just about asking questions. Asking questions is fundamental and it's probably the most difficult part of the job, but without answers, you don't have a philosophy. You just have an inquiry, a wandering around. And if you look at the history of philosophy, it's full of answers, some ridiculous, some outrageous, some we're still learning from them. Classics are the ones that we still read because their open answers are still able to teach us something for our time, in our time, etc. But answers they are. You know, Plato, Aristotle, all the way you know, to the main people I mentioned in these lectures, Kant or before Descartes, Wittgenstein, Heidegger, Husserl, you name it, whoever you want to pick up, they offer answers. They're not just there wondering, should I this or should I that? Is this so or is this that? Timely, as I said, no, timeless. Um, we need it now for our human project as a design of the sort of uh, uh, cultural framework that enables us to improve both our society and what surrounds us, our nature. The problems we are facing are, are too pressing uh, to waste time doing some minor scholarly useless sort of uh, footnotes to the big guys uh, and guys they are normally. Uh, we need to play firsthand the philosophical game. To do that, uh, and I'm coming to the very, very last few slides, and then we have uh, maybe um, uh, a moment of break because I need to shift to the uh, next lecture. Remember when I told you that uh, Plato had much more of an ambiguous position when it comes to the maker's knowledge? Um, the Plato that we have inherited, the Plato of the textbooks, is the one that says, uh, the maker doesn't really know things um, so well, uh, is the user that uh, knows them uh, much, much better. But Plato has also other positions about uh, who an is. 
And I find this uh, from Kratlis particularly enlightening. Uh, I keep referring to it and to the next one uh, in the next slide. Anoa is a human being, uh, a man or a woman, who knows how to ask and answer questions. Remember, that's philosophy. Ask and answer questions. But also, and this is where I told you, it's a little bit more ambiguous than uh, the tradition has uh, told us Plato looks like. The sort of knowledge no, once you uh, that you uh, require, no, as a as a knower who ask and answer questions, is that which happens to be a union or making a knowing how to use the thing made, making. That's the Orthodemus. So it's also about making things, building models, not just looking at uh, the uh, the uh, representation. It's about blueprints. It's not just about representations. So, um, of course, I add there uh, the thing made because today the thing made is information and that's what we are uh, making and uh, using all the time. But this is a sort of 21st century translation of uh, a platonic point, which I think makes still a lot of sense. I told you at the end uh, and um, uh, I want to end with, uh, I don't particularly enjoy uh, reading Bill Gates normally. Uh, I find him uh, um, intellectually uh, shallow uh, and often wrong, um, but uh, uh, as a, uh, of course uh, one of the most successful business uh, and uh, person in, in the world, uh, it certainly has lessons to teach. Um, I found this lecture particularly uh, challenging for us in this virtual room. Uh, it was giving a, um, a keynote uh, at MIT uh, in 2010, so that's some time ago. And then he asked this very difficult question, difficult for us, you know, difficult for our philosopher. Are the brightest minds working on the most important problems? And then he has a list of these problems, improving the lives of the poorest, improving education, health, nutrition, improving peaceful interactions, human rights, environmental conditions, living standards. And I add, clearly, the brightest minds philosophically speaking, should not be an exception. It's too easy just to say, oh, look, no, someone else will take care of this. Uh, and uh, trust me, philosophers are particularly um, sort of arrogant when it comes to who is the brightest in the room. They think that they are, no matter what mathematicians, what physicists, what poets, what uh, uh, lit lit literature Nobel laureates say, the philosopher will always think that he or she knows better, more, more profoundly, asks the deepest questions, has the you know, most uh, amazing answers. So if he is coherent, if philosophers, she, he or she are really considering themselves the brightest of philosophical minds, are they working on these problems? I would say yes. It's just a couple of steps removed. So you don't have to be on the ground giving clean water to someone uh, remember the 800 million people without clean water uh, to make a difference to the most pressing issues in the world. The contribution sometimes, uh, going back to the most important problems, is to understand what are the most important problems, how we address them, what needs to be done in terms of sort of cultural and social understanding of all this. So anyone has uh, no, their own jobs. And the job of the philosopher is to do the conceptual design properly so that it does make a difference to these things. Improving the poorest, uh, the lives of the poor, education, health, nutrition, all the way to peaceful uh, interactions, human rights, environmental conditions, living standards, and a better life and a better human project on this planet. Now, if philosophy works in favor of better lives, better society, better environment, a good human project, then is the philosophy that we want to have at this time. And then the brightest philosophical minds will have joined the effort. If it is working on some kind of an intellectual game to see whether you know, the, those particular uh, uh, sort of uh, pieces on the chessboard can be put differently or a move can be made against someone else to prove them wrong, etc. Well, we're not doing the right philosophy that I hope we will be developing. Certainly not the kind of philosophy I want to do. So my invitation in uh, for everyone in this room, and we I can see we are quite a number. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time on philosophers' problems. There's plenty of philosophical problems that join their effort. They are part of exactly that uh, sort of movement, and philosophical minds should not be an exception. 
The real issue, therefore, is how can we contribute to their effort by developing the human project for the 21st century? It's ambitious and it's architectural as opposed to helping placing that particular brick on that particular wall in that particular construction. It's a much more philosophical endeavour, but it contributes exactly to the same kind of trend. For that, no, there will be uh, a few more lectures and I hope we will end up uh, covering that topic uh, in this course. But before that, we need to address, and that's the last lecture, uh, slide for this lecture, the second topic in our ontological inquiry. Remember, the digital inscribes, inscribes not just reality, it inscribes the subject, us, the self, the I, the me, 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 the soul, the mind, different cultures, different philosophies have different terminology and very different nuance sort of understanding of what it means to talk about the subject. But so far, we've been talking about the object, external reality, the world in itself, the system understood as what we encounter, bump into, what opposes us in the German word, which is fantastic, the Gegenstand, what stands against you, which reacts and resists your interactions. And by the way, if you don't like the German word, Peirce had a similar view about reality, is what resists your effort. That is what we find interactable. Well, we cover that, uh, I'm afraid, in a, way, in a way that should be much deeper and I hope much more refined uh, by other people. But we touch, uh, I hope, a few interesting points in terms of ontology of reality, or to put it more carefully, epistemological ontology of a system where the system is understood as external reality. Now we need to shift to the second topic, which is an epistemological ontology of a system where the system is the subject, it's us. The digital reontologizes not just the object, not just the external world, but reontologizes also ourselves. In that sense, it is ego poietic. A simple word, trust me, uh, just a shortcut to mean poietic, making ego the self. The digital changes the self, transform the self, is a technology of the self. And as a technology of the self, which I think is an expression already used by Foucault, if I'm not wrong, um, we need to understand a little bit better what that means. To do that, we need to move to the next lecture. So at this point, I would say that we uh, maybe take uh, just about 10 minutes break, uh, if uh, everybody agrees. And um, uh, it's 39, we reconvene at, shall we say 45. So six minutes from now, I'll uh, stop for a moment glass of water, and I introduce the next lecture. Then there will be time for Q&A. So if Claudio is okay, um, we uh, stop for a moment and uh, uh, reconvene in about six minutes.
Okay, uh, I think we are back online and we will start in just about a minute or two. Well, uh, welcome back, everybody. I hope uh, I'm just going to check with Claudio whether you can see lecture three. Yes, we can. OK, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Claudio. And um, let me thank Claudio again because uh, uh, it looks like the passwords are not coming. <laughs> so we just double check this morning uh, and uh, uh, the uh, the lectures uh, will keep going uh, the way they are, uh, being online uh, until uh, the American consulate will decide to uh, give us back uh, the passport and I will be able to come to Bologna. Until further notice, therefore, just assume that everything happens online. It is also unclear um, and I'm ex uh, waiting for instructions whether we will have a lecture tomorrow. As you probably know, uh, Berlusconi uh, died um, and um, because he was prime minister uh, several times, I think four, there will be a national uh, morning uh, tomorrow. Um, it's unclear whether um, institutions like uh, uh, universities, for example, will be open and deliver their services as usual or will be closed um, because of the event. Uh, I try to be as neutral as possible in telling you this um, to make sure that uh, you don't read anything uh, political in the possibility that I will not be lecturing tomorrow. It's an institutional uh, decision uh, in uh, uh, with regard to what the university uh, decides to do or this or not. If the university uh, is open, uh, I will be um, giving this lecture uh, as usual. So far, we haven't received any particular instructions, I ask. And uh, uh, I was told that today uh, giving the lecture was fine and therefore here we are. It might be, uh, it is reasonable to expect that tomorrow uh, there would not be uh, a lecture. Which means that today we start and probably uh, just uh, scratch the surface of the topic of lecture number three. The topic for lecture number three is equally um, vast. <laughs> And as in lecture number two, I will be able to provide only a few hints and, um, as I said before, scratch the surface. The attempt is to provide points of departure for your personal investigations and um, travels, uh, intellectually speaking, while at the same time giving you what I hope is an over, overview of the way I approach these topics. Uh, the sharing of this overview uh, is not done in terms of indoctrination, but is done in terms of uh, showing how one can cope with these uh, issues and therefore uh, sharing with you some experiences which 
I hope it may be useful when you will do your personal uh, work on topics of your own interest. I think someone's on at the moment in terms of... Uh, um, no, thank you. Uh, We can start just by looking at the uh, topics covered by lecture uh, three. We spoke about the on life experience, um, this transformation in our everyday life, especially in the uh, rich uh, developed north, um, global north. Uh, uh, a few countries uh, already have the on life experience as the default experience, certainly, for example, on a personal basis. Uh, just look at what we're doing today in terms of this uh, online lecture. The online experience, uh, very quickly, is um, the sort of experience you have when you no longer ask whether you are online or offline, but you take for granted that the two are mixing and uh, merging together in a single sort of continuum. Part of the or topic number two, the construction of personal identity, uh, is what we ended uh, with uh, when finishing the previous lecture the ego poetic uh, uh, effect uh, impact that digital technologies are having on personal identity who we think we are and can be the relationship between our data and our personal uh, choices uh, preferences inclinations and finally uh, the topic covered will be technologies of hope how the construction of the self um, this new on life experience that leads to the construction of self how the uh, construction of self it can be approached from a perspective which hinges on what we hope we can be, what we hope we can achieve, what kind of a, uh, meaning in uh, we hope we can uh, build uh, in terms of our lives. So the three topics are uh, in sort of put in a sort of uh, logical progression. Uh, we'll start uh, by looking at the uh, construction of the self. And to do so, there is the usual little map. We'll go back to the writing and reading, uh, which has been uh, with us since lecture number one. Who is writing and who is, who is reading what? Remember the writing and reading of reality, the writing and reading of the self. Then move to the point, the point, uh, sorry, uh, I just noticed that uh, something I, I, I want to um, uh, remark about before I go any further. Uh, there's quite a bit of Greek in this <laughs> sort of uh, table of content, uh, but every single word is quite uh, straightforward and simple. So um, to be explained as we get there. Ego poiesis or construction of the self is a shortcut to uh, cover all the processes behind the impact of digital technologies on our self-understanding and how we shape ourselves. One of them I think is so important that I want to focus on it specifically. And I use that word anagnorisis, which is a word that is made uh, technical and famous by Aristotle when talking about the tragedy uh, and the nature of theater, etc. Um, I won't tell you what it means because uh, it otherwise would be uh, anticipating that not several slides, but is a special way of reconstructing a meaningful life. More on this when we get there. Equally important, I think, is uh, understanding our own existence as a hapax legomenon. Uh, again, another Greek expression, this time comes from uh, philology. It's very simple, and it means a word a hap that occurs only once in a text. Imagine that you pick up the whole Bible, and I will do that, or the whole Homer, or the entire corpus of Shakespeare, and one word occurs only once. There's nothing magic again in that sort of um, occurrence, singular, unique occurrence, but once it is. And I like to think of uh, our life universe as uh, that particular hapax legomenon in the book of nature. The book of nature is big, uh, but it contains unique sort of occurrences. We are one of them, nothing magic, nothing special, nothing uh, superhuman, um, nothing miraculous, and yet quite unique. Then, of course, we'll discuss uh, the no, topic of hope, techno hope, etc., as uh, per title of the lecture. 
on the writing and reading, uh, I feel that, uh, you know, as you can tell, I'll be sort of omnivorous when it comes to sources. Um, this uh, comes from Proust. Uh, you might have recognized uh, the gentleman uh, in the picture. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful, very intense, uh, amazing way of connecting the writing and reading in Galileo about nature to the writing and reading of the self in our society. So if you like, Galileo does to the writing and reading uh, of nature what Proust does to the writing and reading of the self in the social world. And if you keep reading, and I hope you've been reading as I speak, um, I put uh, in bold uh, the essential point. Our social personality is created by the thoughts of other people. Uh, even the simple act, which we describe as seeing someone we know, is to some extent an intellectual process. We pack the physical outline of the kitchen we see with all the ideas we have already formed about him, and in the complete picture by him, of him, sorry, which we compose in our minds, those ideas have certain uh, the, prin the principal place. But here comes the, the thing. In the end, they come to fill out so completely the curve of cheeks, etc. They blend so harmoniously um, that by the time we've done all this, each time we see the face or hear the voice, it is our own ideas of him which we recognize and to which we listen. Now this, uh, with the previous uh, sort of um, uh, analogy here, uh, we need only be turned up like a page in an account book or the record of a will, goes to hand in hand with the previous metaphor by Galileo. Not only nature can be seen as a book, the book of nature, but also us. We, in a sort of more Freudian way, uh, rather shallow uh, Freudian way of speaking, we also uh, book the, to ourselves, and we're not quite sure we always read the right text in ourselves. The Proustian point uh, becomes a matter of who writes whom and who reads whom in this book analogy of the self. And that's part of the uh, general point I want to make in terms of reading and writing. So reading and writing, the world, Galileo, the I, the subject, Proust, or to put it even uh, more simplistically, reading and writing the object, Galileo, reading and writing the subject, in Proust. But this reading and writing is basically the whole story. Uh, you also need to add execute. Uh, this, you know, for those of you uh, who haven't seen this Unix uh, in the past, this is just a, a way of uh, um, uh, deciding who can read and write and execute what, not permission classes, depending on the user, group, other, etc. But the R and the W and the X, the read and write and execute, is really, if you think of it, all we do in life. Of course, the read and write execute that I'm talking about are a bit richer than just read and write and execute a file. But you know, you uh, talk to someone, uh, you listen to someone, you do something to someone, or someone does something to you. You do something uh, to the environment, or the environment does something to you, so execute. But all our interactions uh, as subjects and objects in this so oversimplified game is a, a kind of read, write, execute. And back to a point that we will not cover here, if you want to read, write and execute properly, effectively, successfully, you need to do that ethically, of course, uh, that's one side, more on this in the future, but you also need to do it in a way that is competent. The more languages spoken by reality, uh, spoken by information, you master, the more you can read, write, and execute. So this is on a side, and not for today, uh, is a sort of uh, potential um, development for anyone who wants to go down this particular road. But read and write is all we're going to concentrate on when it comes to the object, the world, external reality, and the I, the subject, the self, in this particular lecture. This is a reminder, or we just saw in the previous lecture, the digital is kind of the subject as well, the digital real world is the subject, the digital is eco-poetic. Why this eco-poetic perspective? This uh, also leads to a lecture on uh, human dignity, which we will not develop in this course, but it's important as a quick reminder. 
we can do the reading and writing of uh, human nature, of the self, of the I, of ourselves and of other people, because we are work in progress. Uh, more uh, contemporary terminology, we are open software and written text. So uh, this comes from um, the uh, manifesto of uh, Renaissance uh, culture, um, is from uh, Pico della Mirandola, a Renaissance philosopher, who wrote this uh, text on the nature of humanity uh, and the whole human dignity, so to speak. And he tells us uh, at the top that uh, humans are neither angels nor brutes or robots, we will say today, because they are open and malleable. They can change and they can change themselves and they can transform themselves in terms of a project. Today, we also say that they have interest and they have goals that they want to pursue. Now, this openness is all I want to stress here. I don't want to go down the, the, the road of uh, human dignity that would lead us uh, far away uh, and it's for another lecture on uh, privacy uh, as it is linked to human dignity. But we can stop here just to understand one single important element in our sort of discussion analysis. Writing and reading the self is made possible by the fact that the self is open to change. If we were predetermined, if we were fully deterministic, there would be no writing and no um, uh, interventions. We will be just uh, uh, to be read, uh, if you like, as we uh, read the, uh, the clock. This openness is subject to, therefore, transformation, manipulation, uh, intervention. And that's what I call uh, egopoiesis. I want to cover this uh, topic very briefly, and then we can stop um, and have some Q and A. Uh, I can see that we are almost in the half an hour that we can dedicate to some interactions. So this is back to Plato. Plato, as you can tell, I have a few heroes who have influenced uh, my way of thinking. Uh, Plato, Descartes, Kant. Uh, they're not many, but they are no, no, big guys. Um, and uh, this is Plato, Plato in the Phaedrus talking about the soul. Today we will be talking about the I or the self. And he says, well, look, I'm not quite sure, but we can uh, talk about a soul as a kind of a chair, with, uh, a chariot, sorry, uh, with a charioteer, uh, the, uh, the driver, and two horses. Uh, the charioteer of the human soul drives the, the pairs. Uh, one is noble, uh, the other one is more, more difficult. Um, we're going to investigate this. What you get, remember the multi-agent system uh, point that I started with in the methodology? What actually Pedro, uh, Plato is describing is a multi-agent system. Two horses and a charioteer. It doesn't take multi-agent system more than that. It's already three. So already in Plato, although of course this is not Plato's terminology, but no, that's, remember, reontologizing, reinterpreting uh, in light of the present, the past, etc. Well, we can read Phaedrus as providing us a, a model of the self, which is based on a multi-agent analysis of the self. Three agents, two horses and a human being, uh, the Chanotria, uh, interacting to make sure that things go well. What is also very interesting and something that you don't find in, at least to my, the best of my understanding, and uh, in any sort of commentary on this super famous passage, is that the work done by all the bits that make sure that the system is actually coordinated. The chariot and the tack, as I write there, as the structure that guarantees unity coordination. Those are what allow the system to be persist act as a single and continuous entity. We can say much more about this, but it's crucial to focus not just on the three agents, but also on what keeps the three agents together. Why do I do this? Why am I stressing this? Well, because not only we have a multi-agent system, but what we don't have and what we should have is a relational understanding of a multi-agent analysis of the self, meaning what keeps together these three agents. These are not a horse and another horse in a charioteer walking down the road. There's something immensely missing here. The chariot, the tack, what keeps them together, what makes them interact properly. And if you want to work on the interactions between these three agents, you need to have the right uh, chariot, so to speak. 
So you need to work also on the relations. A bit of extra sort of uh, history of philosophy here. In terms of ontology of the I, ontology of the self, ontology of the ego uh, or egology, but no, again, it's just another word, drop it if you don't like it. Remember, we're doing the ontology of the subject now. We stop doing the ontology of the object of external reality. We're looking at the ontology of the self. Well, the uh, Plato's had a, a, an ethical interest in it. It was interest in the no, life of the multi-agent system. It, uh, it didn't quite uh, care about the structure, the ontology. What he wanted to focus on, say, is, well, once you have this multi-agent system, what's the good way of developing the interactions between the different components of these uh, multi-agent systems so that they lead to a good life, ethically speaking. What we want to understand a little bit better is exactly how you keep this tripartite multi-agent system together. Remember the, the relations between them. And here you find two uh, ordinary approaches in philosophy. Uh, let me show you both of them. One is a diachronic analysis of the self or diachronic egology. The ontology of the ego, no, so that ultimate description. Remember, what we're doing is not just ontology, it's an epistemological ontology of the ego. And if you want to be really impressive in a party tomorrow, when you meet someone, he says, well, what did you do during the lecture? We discussed the diachronic epistemological egology, and nobody will understand a word of it, but I hope you do. Um, so if we want to analyze ontology, something, the ego, uh, the, uh, the self, the subject, from an epistemological perspective, how we model that particular system, and we do that through time, diachronically, then you have the problem uh, in philosophy of personal identity. In other words, how you re-identify through time or possible worlds the same self. To put it super simply, how do I know that Luciano today is the same Luciano that he was yesterday or 10 years ago, and he would be the same Luciano had the world been slightly different? Suppose, for example, had he moved already to Yale last month, would he be the same or would he be a something, someone else? So just to summarize, that is a whole uh, sort of a huge area of philosophy of mind dedicated to the philosophy of personal identity. The stress is on identity, how you re-identify the same individual through time or possible circumstances when from our own way of approaching this, you are modeling that particular system modeling ontology from an epistemological perspective of that system called the ego. So the modeling of the ego becomes ecology, diachronic, etc. I hope you get that point. A bit not unpacking, but hopefully the terminology is not too off-putting. On the right hand side, you have a synchronic ecology. The point, the point is, uh, is not to understand how that system remains the same through time, but what it is in itself, or rather how we can model it at that time. What is it? Remember, the question we're asking is always from a modeling perspective. We're not trying to get the eye in itself, but we're trying to understand what it looks like from a modeling uh, uh, reading. So the ontology of the ego or self becomes a matter of philosophy of personal identity. What does it mean to be a, that person? So it's not about identification, but it's about characterization in time or in a possible world of the individual. So to put it super simply, on the left, is Luciano the same here, there, as it was in a different place at a different time, etc. How do I know that that individual is the same through time and through possible worlds? On the right, who is that individual? What kind of uh, characteristics qualify that individual as that individual and not someone else. How do I know that is Luciano and not Claudio? Okay, so these two sort of uh, lines of development have received two different answers. Um, the uh, diachronic uh, or diatopic through space or through time re-identification has endurantism, uh, is a, uh, an expression in philosophy, or perdurantism, as positions in philosophy of mind. And one tells you, well, a self, a whole object, the, the, 
you uh, exist at each moment of its history and it's the same self moving through. No? So it's like a, as if you were a, um, uh, a boat moving through a river. It's the same boat through time, through space, through possible circumstances, because the boat doesn't change. But Durantism is the view that that self, that subject, uh, is a four-dimensional entity which is made of uh, a series of spatial and temporal parts. It's like a frame of a film. So you are, you are the same film, but each part of that film uh, is a different self. It's almost like as if you had a very, very long life uh, made of frames uh, and like a film, the unity of that film lasts through time by extending through time. So it's not a boat that goes through the river, but it's like a movie going through time. These two positions, plenty of debates, etc. We will not get into that. What we do get um, what is what we don't want to have as a problem. Now, this um, endurantism, perdurantism, the philosophy of mind often talks about the self from a system perspective, ignoring the level of abstractions, the modeling, the epistemological approach to ontology of the self. Not in these lectures, not for us. And I'll stop here with this uh, last um, uh, point. Um, what we don't have as a problem is the classic Theseus ship problem, or if you like, the grandfather's axe. I'm told it's a Polish, um, uh, not from Poland, um, uh, a, a joke, uh, but I'm not sure. It might be uh, common to other cultures. The Theseus ship is famous. Uh, Theseus has this particular ship in the harbor. Uh, he changes bits, uh, keeps changing bits. At the end of the day, you start asking, is this the same ship? Remember, endurantism, perdurantism. Imagine that the ship is actually the self. I'm changing through time. Once I remove this and that, I change my nationality, my language, my inclinations, my taste, uh, my age. Uh, I lose hair. My cells are no longer here. I lost so many cells that uh, all my cells are new. Uh, maybe I lost some abilities. I acquire other abilities. Am I the same subject? To put it more simply, is the grandfather's axe. The joke is that this is my father's axe. Uh, my father changed the blade, I changed the handle. Well, what is left of the grandfather's axe? Why is this not a problem for us? I want to stop here. It is not a problem for us because these questions are asked, as you guess, of course, in absolute terms. Is it or is it not the same? And at, at the absolute level, there is no right or wrong answer. It's just impossible to provide any answer. You can keep debating and develop all the possible endurantism and perdurantism in any other positions. You just don't get out of the uh, sort of corner in which you put yourself. Why? Let me give you a different example. Imagine we are downtown and um, you ask me whether the building at the corner is the same building that it was five years ago. Answer number one, no, it is not. It used to be a hospital, now it's a school. I said, oh, okay, fine, yeah, definitely not the same building. And then answer number two, yes, it is. It's exactly the same building I told you, you need to go at that building, the building there used to be a school, now it's a hospital, it doesn't matter, but it's the same building, turn left at that building, and that's where the car park is. The car park is next to the building, it's the same building. So, oh, okay, fine, yes, the same building. Which answer is right and which is wrong? Uh, unless you tell me why you are asking that question, for what purpose, then I can't tell you. So imagine that this use ship is a precious artifact. You are a collector. You ask, is this the same? The answer is definitely not. It's worthless. You change everything in it. Imagine it's no, not this use sort of a uh, very old ship, but it's a, a super fancy car that is used had you not know, saved from you know, the, the 19th century. It has replaced every bit in it. It's worthless. Now, other, uh, other question. Imagine that the question is not asked by the collector, it's asked by the taxman. And it says, this is, is that the same ship? No, no, I change everything. I don't care. That's the tax you have to pay. It's your ship and uh, no, no, not this use sort of uh, trick here. You definitely have to pay the taxes on that ship because it's yours. It's the same. 
But I changed everything. I couldn't care less. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's the same kind of, uh, so for example, shape, the same amount of uh, tons of uh, uh, cargo, etc. Same for the car. Oh, it's a collector car. It's useless now. It has lose all the all the value. I don't care. You still had to pay, you know, this and this and that say, for, to the taxman. So um, I hope the example is suffi sufficiently not silly uh, to make the point clear. When it comes to uh, the problem, which we will ignore in the rest of the lecture, so uh, of a diachronic ecology, you need to have a level of structure. No level of structure, no reasonable space to give any answer that can actually give ground for a disagreement. Remember, we're not going for a final answer no one can disagree with. We are trying to build a ground where we start exchanging reasons pro and contra reasonably. There is a chance of finding some a real friction so that we can get some real advancement in our understanding. We might even understand why we disagree. We might still disagree, but we will know why we disagree. We're not just in an empty space, in a vacuum, when anything and the opposite of anything goes, and you have no way of grasping what reasons are in favor of one or the other position. Now, when it comes to asking that question, is it the same or is it not the same, you need to tell me in what sense are you asking, or what reasons, for what purpose are you asking that question? What is the teleological value of that question? Teleology, meaning no, discourse about the end, the goal of something. If you have a teleological analysis, it means that you're trying to explain what you're doing because of the ends or the goals you are pursuing. So what is the teleological value of these questions? If you don't tell me, then I have no ground to exchange reasons pro and contra. Whatever answer is coming. At that point, anyone's game. At this point, we stop here because this is what we're going to investigate in the rest of the um, uh, lecture. So I wanted to make sure that in terms of understanding the self, we could get rid of half of the discussion, which is fundamental, is important, needs to be addressed properly, level of abstractions, and is the nature of the self as the self changes through time. That's not what we're going to inquire in the rest of the lecture. What we want to uh, inquire is something that comes logically before. Before asking whether it is or is not the same through time or in different circumstances, so-called possible worlds, the previous question is, what is the self? What is the nature of the self? And how, remember, uh, the digital revolution changes our understanding of the self. That is the topic we're going to address in the next lecture. At this point, uh, however, I stop here uh, and uh, sharing, and we have a bit of time for Q&A. Anyone there uh, who may have questions or clarifications, comments? And meanwhile, I'm just checking whether I receive any instructions about the lecture tomorrow. So let me see. Uh, yeah, not yet, but I will tell you before saying goodbye whether it was going to be a lecture or not. Professor. Please. Um, I have a question. Um, can we say, can we use uh, ethics as a common ground to navigate the different worlds uh, in the AI ecosystem? As the way you were explaining that mathematics was convenient for everyone and like the equal symbol is equal for everyone. Can we say that like in the, the AI ecosystems we can use ethics to navigate and create this level of abstraction where we can find the disagreements and then find the agreements? Thank you. That's a that's a very interesting point, and I I, I would incline to say yes, um, but it has to be a qualified yes. Um, and I think you put it with great precision when you said ethics as a ground where we can have disagreements. Um, I like that very much. I mean, that's very well formulated. Um, the point I hope I'm, I'm interpreting what you're saying correctly. Um, is not having ethics as a ground where people finally agree and cannot disagree on what is uh, a value or the right way of living or the right choices to make or this not the, the right should and shouldn't. But it's a place where we can be clear and hopefully convincing 
in exchanging reasons about what is the right thing to do, what is the right life to have. Now, this is not just a, a philosophical maneuver. Ethics, if anything, needs to be tolerant. Not for today and not for this uh, set of lectures, but there is a reason why tolerance should be, it seems to me, a privilege when it comes, logically speaking, to the interplay between tolerance and justice. No, we started a debate in modernity with Locke, putting tolerance at the, as the cornerstone of society. We shifted later with Kant and replaced tolerance with justice. Um, the, it's a long story and I don't want to waste your time here uh, to, to discuss why I think tolerance is, is, a, is a better foundation. Uh, but even if it is not, uh, it remains one of the founding grounds for our interactions uh, when it comes to ethical choices. So the point that you made, uh, we could, uh, we, we should, we, and in fact, often we do have ethical discussion as the common shared uh, sort of space where we can exchange reasons, but reasons are what we need to exchange in that space. And that's the only sort of qualification uh, extra that I would add. So one uh, is a space where you may expect disagreement, uh, it's not a space which constrains people, uh, which forces people to agree. And two, by providing room for pluralism and discussion is also the space where we exchange reasons and therefore we can change our minds. Because ultimately, I would say, but that's again, a very personal view, there is the right kind of ethics and there is the wrong kind of ethics. That it is not true that uh, anything goes. Having said that, there's also a lot of space for you no know, good ethical decisions. I might decide that, for example, for some people, it's better to uh, have that kind of life rather than another kind of life. Um, it becomes a matter of personal choice that has no impact on uh, other lives or other individuals or society. So to summarize, I agree with you. I think there's a good move. Uh, it's a space where we can uh, uh, agree and disagree. Um, it's not a space where we constrain people and force people to agree to whatever we said is right. And as an open space of disagreement is where we exchange reasons. The exchanging of reasons should be able um, to leave people uh, free to change their minds uh, and improve. Um, if that is the world in which we uh, can live, then tolerance becomes the governing principle together with others. I mean, uh, um, the, other, the other are uh, essentially freedom and, and uh, uh, justice. But I would say tolerance first um, in that particular perspective that you share with us. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Please, Angelica. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Professor. Um, um, I'm sorry, I don't think it's, if it's, it's a wrong question because it's not mm, very clearly in my mind, I'm a little bit still confused about it, but um, it's a, a question about the purpose. Um, in the past, I assume uh, that uh, a sort of sex skepticism uh, about tech and uh, I uh, may come from a problem uh, uh, about culture and access of the people. Uh, and, but now, assume that we are in a democracy and uh, we have a rule of law, uh, with the speed uh, about uh, uh, the refining of the tech and uh, sometimes uh, the evolving <laughs> of it, um, how we can uh, uh, project, design a system uh, if we have no time for fill the gap. We are still in time to fill the gap, to create, to pr project a system, to design a system for a model uh, that can uh, uh, involve uh, everyone uh, and uh, let them uh, uh, have uh, a culture that can make an access to the tech and not thinking that we are making that. I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm explaining well, sorry, but that's uh, my question. Okay, let, let, let's see if I, uh, I'm not sure, uh, and I don't want to misinterpret what you said. Um, 
I think there's there's a point that I I think I grasp uh, uh, in your question, which is um, a sense of urgency in terms of how much faster the um, the world and especially the world of technology, but the world in general is changing, developing, creating new gaps, closing gaps. No, it's a magmatic, uh, fast moving, um, uh, deeply changing world there and how slowly uh, sort of the design of, say, the human project or even uh, the sort of discussions that we're having today uh, progresses. So uh, to put it in, in terms of the previous question, the, the space of reason where we exchange uh, reasons pro and contra in terms of open problems uh, needs time uh, and it's time for reflection, times for um, more informed uh, uh, deliberations and so on. Meanwhile, the world is going bananas. Uh, so it's like uh, deliberating on this airplane that is going <laughs> all over the place and possibly you know, uh, crashing. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you know, we the, the, uh, on that plane, uh, we are deliberating what to do, how to do it, and what's the right life, and what's the kind of design of technology they want to have, etc. And there's a certain urgency uh, of saying, look, how do we cover this gap between how slowly we can decide, think, deliberate, uh, this develop our own human project, and how fast uh, the world is is moving. I, I'm afraid there is, <laughs> so if I, I, I grasp this point, and maybe I address this only this point, um, if I didn't misinterpret your uh, uh, question uh, too, too badly. It's correct. <laughs> that, that, yeah, okay, good. No, so if that, that is the, the, uh, the difficulty. Um, we can only um, minimize that difficulty, but we cannot overcome it. Um, the asymmetry between thinking and doing, essentially, uh, is um, it's in human history. Uh, the, I'm always simplifying, but no, the doing, the changing, the, the acting, the interacting, the pressing problem that needs to be solved today, uh, and the thinking about it. The thinking is inevitably, uh, seems to me, uh, always a bit slower than the doing. There is a saving point here, which we need to understand, uh, and I stress this all the time. The thinking happens also before the doing, as in not because uh, I'm doing X and I need to think about X before doing X, but because while I'm doing X, I can also think way ahead of the Z and the Y and so on in the future. So the only good way of addressing problems is not to react to problems, but to anticipate problems. So let me I'll put this in slightly different. The asymmetry between um, um, thinking and doing when it comes to thinking and doing about the same thing it's inevitable. Normally we do X before thinking about X. It's, or we, we do X while thinking about X, but it comes in, not in the nature of our life that uh, as we go through anything, uh, um, that anything is also being thought and understood and vice versa. But if we're stuck with this, only this, which is true, then we are totally doomed. The important thing is to understand that thinking is also thinking, as they say, ahead of what is going to happen, what you're doing, is, in other words, building a project, um, projecting towards the future, anticipating um, foresight analysis uh, in a more policy-oriented uh, context, uh, having a strategy. That's why, um, with a little analogy, and I, I close here my, my long answer, forgive me, for anyone who plays chess here, um, or hasn't uh, nah, even watched Queen's Gambit, I mean, um, a good chess player is not a tactical chess player. It's not someone who that move and I react to that move. It's someone who has a view of where the game will be many, many, many moves down the road. And it acts according to that picture, not the immediate interaction now to the move that the opponent has just made. Uh, 
but to then say five, six, 10, 15 moves that will happen, oh, I'm speculating 15 moves is way too many, yeah? uh, but um, for the non chess players, just in case, uh, they say four, five uh, moves that will happen way down the road, which have not happened, but which I can start working, assuming that they will happen. But that's why I insist so much on philosophy. That's what exactly philosophy does. It enables you to take that distance from the present to think about the future before the future happens. At that point, that asymmetry that we have between the thinking and the doing about the same object doesn't apply. Because what, while we're doing and thinking about A, we're also thinking about B and C and D before actually doing B and C and D. At that point, you have a plan, you have a project and a direction in which you want to send your society, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if that is what we're talking about, then that is, to me, uh, what philosophy does best, better than other disciplines, certainly uh, better than uh, sort of the usual social sciences, because it's his, it's his task, is to think in sort of more abstract terms and say, what, what do we want to get to? What kind of uh, sort of end of, of the game we want to uh, achieve or play? Um, if you like, in a different metaphor, forget about chess, what's the end of the journey? And therefore, what journey we need to build to get to that particular end. Clearly, while I'm driving, I'm, no, I'm driving and thinking about driving, and the thinking happens at best while I'm driving. Certainly, it doesn't happen before I have driven through that particular stage. But the thinking and driving uh, happens at the same time with a bit of a no, driving first and thinking at the same time or well, slightly uh, later. Whereas the planning of the journey, that's what the philosophy that we want to do. So I think there is uh, uh, the second aspect which needs to be um, also highlighted. Otherwise, in terms of just uh, thinking and doing the same thing, well, there is always an asymmetry in favour of the pragmatic rather than the theoretical sort of uh, side. It is uh, 11.31, so uh, I, I can see just, just one more hand up. Thank uh, you needs to leave now thank you uh, that was a really important point to clarify um maybe we get this one very very quickly and i say goodbye um uh, meanwhile uh, i'm afraid uh, there will be no lecture tomorrow um uh, so uh, i don't know how to inform the other people not in this call uh, anymore i know there's 65 people start leaving um there were about 90 something people before um, no lecture tomorrow, um, I'm afraid for uh, the uh, funeral of Berlusconi who will happen in Milan. Uh, they are the funeral, not of Berlusconi, of, but of someone who was prime minister for four times. That's what we are respecting by not having the lecture tomorrow. Uh, it will be improper to go about as if nothing had happened. Uh, is a four times prime minister who is um, being um, uh, should we say celebrated, uh, and remember uh, tomorrow. Uh, so uh, as an institution, uh, um, we will not uh, work. Um, um, I like to stress, this is not Berlusconi, the person is the uh, four times prime minister that is being um, uh, subject of a, a national uh, mourning. Um, final question, uh, and I'll see you uh, Hopefully uh, in person, but I'm not sure. Next Monday for sure online. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. Um, really an honor and pleasure to having the chance to follow your lectures on such a timely topic. Um, I assume that not all of us, uh, not all of the attendees here come from the same background, so probably the perspectives of questioning differ somehow. Um, I want to rely my question to what you have elaborated so far and also to your emphasizes that uh, we need a philosophy of information as the conceptual design of our time, for our time, so timely, not timeless. In your opinion, overall, how much we can rely on the philosophical heritage of human history so far to cope somehow the time with the timely challenges as well as the opportunities of our nowadays digital reality. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Great question. That is uh, really a great question also to close uh, this um, this week lecture. Um, just to repeat, there will be no lecture tomorrow um, due to the uh, funeral of the uh, four times prime minister in Milan. Um, I hope we can rely on that a lot. Uh, 
when I use the metaphor of the book, and I have used that many times, you know, Galileo, uh, Proust, but also uh, on a personal basis, I like to stress that all the previous classic philosophy is providing all the previous chapters we need to have read and we need to rely on to write our own chapter. So this is not an attempt to start from scratch and say, abandon everything, forget everything. We can just pretend that nothing has ever happened. As you might have seen also in my sort of, uh, slides, etc., I try to refer to classic philosophical analysis when I can, even if I'm not an historian. So I do that in a sort of conceptual way that I hope is not incorrect, um, philologically speaking. Um, there is a qualification that follows that, which is our interest in past philosophy should not be an interest in the past as a past. It's not archaeology um, and it's not historical philological analysis. We should be, forgive me for the strong term, uh, almost violent in acquiring resources from past philosophers. We will be pirates. We will steal and, uh, uh, and cheat whatever it takes in order to acquire conceptual um, capital from those philosophers and reuse it for our own uh, ends. If you have ever visited Rome, um, you will see that a lot of the churches have been built by reusing, stealing, uh, adapting, uh, materials, especially columns, uh, from uh, Roman uh, temples. What they're reusing, uh, which is very much thrown upon um, at some point, is a very strong, uh, perhaps extreme analogy that I want to use here. Uh, we need to have all the possible philosophical capital that we can get from the past, which is enormous and incredibly valuable, but we need to get it to use it, not to admire, study, um, interpret, comment. That is a different job. That is the job of a philologist, is, is, is the job of a historian. Uh, it's not a job of a philosopher. A philosopher uh, is in that sense, as I said, is a pirate. He goes, steals, and um, when we will have stolen enough, Hopefully, there will be also enough of our own contribution to provide the philosophy of our own time, ready to be <laughs> subject to the same kind of practice by future philosophical pirates who hopefully will steal from us whatever is good that we have created with our own hands. Uh, but that sense of uh, not caring so much about did they really say this? Did they really not say this? Was this the debate? Was I right and wrong in that particular sort of scholastic debate is that there ah, we shouldn't care uh, we should just go there and say is this something that i need for my own work today to build the kind of philosophy that i need for the 21st century yes then steal it they have no mercy but if it is useless there is no point in having a debate now what is useful to steal and what is not that is oh, very much a philosophical inquiry and i cannot provide an answer because each of us has their own taste interest, architecture in mind, particular philosophical inclination, something that you may find incredibly uh, useless, I may find super precious, and uh, vice versa. So it's not a, a single recipe for everybody, but still we must. And with that unethical sort of conclusion, <laughs> I'll see you next week. Uh, thanks again uh, to Claudio and everybody uh, on this uh, sort of uh, virtual uh, call. As a, a reminder, there will be no lecture tomorrow. Uh, we will uh, have the next lecture next Monday, same time, same space here uh, virtually. And fingers crossed, me next to Claudio, if Claudio will join me in that room. But otherwise, uh, online for sure, potentially also physically in Bologna. Fingers crossed if I get the passport back. Have a good day. <laughs> Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you.